Emily. Um, my name is Janelle Warren. For those of you just joining us uh, with the uh, Education Department here at Ontario Good Roads Association, we're very excited to be offering this webinar today in partnership with MTO, all about bridge inspections, assessing defects and details for safety. This webinar is being recorded and will be available afterwards through the OGRA website. We'll be sure to send you that link after the webinar takes place. Um, for those of you just joining us, I'm curious to know if uh, for our statistics and to know how many people we were able to reach with this webinar today. If you haven't yet, let me know uh, through the chat or question function how many people are attending with you. Please do so. And my clock just turned to one o'clock. So we'll go ahead and get started with our presentation today. Um, before I forget, I also want to mention that we do hope to be able to take questions, but we're going to wait till the end of the presentation to take to uh, get those questions from you, just to make sure we have time to get through all the content. Uh, so with that, I'm very excited to introduce you uh, today to our hosts. We have with us today, Daryl Langendoon uh, with MTO, along with his colleague, Jim Au. Unfortunately, Neil Brockman's unable to join us due to illness, but I'm confident Jim and Daryl will be able to take care of everything for us. Daryl, Jim, I'll turn things over to you. Okay, thank you, Janelle. Can you hear us okay? Sounds good. Not Everybody right. else, can you hear Daryl okay? We'll just give him a quick second to answer. Oh, and the yeses are coming in. Sounds good. Good. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this webinar. Uh, thank you also to Ontario Good Roads Association for inviting us to speak. We will be presenting on bridge inspections, but more specifically, we will be talking about identifying and assessing defects and details that can potentially affect bridge safety. Uh, we had three presenters today, um, all of which are from the Ministry of Transportation's bridge office. Unfortunate, unfortunately, Neil Brockman, who's the lead bridge engineer in our rehabilitation section, is sick today and unable to join us. Uh, he did put in a lot of work and putting this material together, though, so I, I thank him anyways. Uh, we also have Jim Au, our Head of Bridge Management, and myself, Daryl Langendoon. And I'm the Lead Bridge Engineer, also in the Bridge Management section. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with MTO's Bridge Office, as part of our work in the Bridge Management section, we are responsible for maintaining the Ontario Structural Inspection Manual. Uh, we provide any updates and revisions as necessary. Uh, we also ensure that MTO is getting all of their bridge inspections done uh, on time. We have recently implemented a new bridge management system, which we call uh, BMS. It is the database we use for storing all of our asset inventory data. Uh, we also use it to store all of our inspection data, which includes the inspections themselves, photos, it generates the reports, also tracks when inspections are due, uh, allows us to assign those tasks to inspectors and things like that. So we are pretty heavily involved in bridge inspections in general with MTO. Uh, just a brief overview of what we are and are not presenting about today. Uh, first, we didn't want this webinar to be in Ontario Structural Inspection Manual or OSIM training. I imagine most of you are familiar with OSIM, but if you are not, the OSIM manual is basically the Bible of bridge inspection in Ontario. It provides just about everything you need for classifying and quantifying any deteriorations or defects you might find on a bridge. Uh, hopefully that's not what you were expecting today, and to be honest, I think that would be probably more boring than what we're hoping to discuss today. Um, in fact, a lot of what we discussed today isn't really covered specifically in the OSIM at all. At all. Uh, instead, we want to go back to more of the basics of a bridge inspection and also to use some of our corporate experience at MTO with bridge inspections to educate others about situations that need special attention in order to ensure bridges are safe. Uh, Neil would have um, provided, but I'll be covering that today, a process, uh, a sort of a mental exercise that owners and engineers can use when defects or issues with the bridge are discovered. Jim will talk about some specific bridge details or uh, previous design practices that require some more caution. Uh, basically, when you see these, you should be on high alert. If you are a bridge owner, you should be aware if you have uh, bridges with these types of details or designs in your inventory. 
Uh, most of these we bring to your attention as a result of MTO or other jurisdictions firsthand experience with actual uh, bridge issues or even failures. So we will also look at some real world examples and case studies to apply uh, some real world application to what we're discussing. Uh, essentially our focus in this webinar will be on the safety of bridges and not so much about capturing the overall condition of bridges. So let's take a second and ask ourselves, what exactly is the purpose of a bridge inspection? Um, well, there are actually a number of purposes. Uh, we want to make sure the bridge is safe, that it is able to carry traffic, pedestrians, or any other users safely. We want to capture any structural issues that could potentially affect safety or durability and follow up to ensure that these are addressed in an appropriate time frame. Three, we want to get an idea of the overall condition of the bridge so we have an idea of its remaining service life. And so we can work on our asset management in terms of funding and planning future bridge work. Uh, this is probably what we spend the most time doing during an inspection. Uh, four, we identify any maintenance work that needs to be completed or is outstanding. Five, uh, we provide a record of the bridge condition and time. So over time, we have an idea of the history of specific bridges, but we're also collecting bridge data in general, which we can use to make informed decisions in the future. So actually, there are a number of different valuable and important purposes of a bridge inspection, but uh, safety is the main goal, and the most important purpose of an inspection is to ensure that the bridge is safe. Everything else that I mentioned really should come second to safety. So uh, next I'd like to talk a little bit about assessing defects in terms of their relevancy, severity, and then using that to determine urgency. Uh, we keep using the word defect, and just to clarify by this, we mean something that has changed from the original condition of the bridge. Uh, in very general terms, some part of the bridge has moved or shifted. There are cracks where previously there were none. Material that was once present is now missing. Uh, I think this is a good way, good way to think just generally about what a defect is. Uh, so when assessing defects, there are three things we can think about. Relevancy. Does this directly affect safety? Does the defect affect the ability of the bridge to perform its function? Does it affect the way a structure carries load? Does it affect its overall strength? Does it affect the overall stability? That type of a thing. Uh, two, then we can think about severity. How bad is it? We have uh, thought about the relevancy if we have moved to step two. Perhaps we've decided the defect is indeed relevant, but what is the magnitude of the defect? And is it just a little nick or a scratch or is it enough of a problem that we need to be concerned? It, it affects safety. Um, but how much does it affect safety? And so three, that would lead us to urgency. How quickly do we need to address the defect? Do we need to close the bridge immediately? Is there time for more investigation? Can the problem wait until the next time we work on this bridge? Uh, so we think we have a process here that can be helpful when we, when we need to make judgment calls. And uh, this is sort of just a good practice in general that, that can be uh, used in addition to OSIN. So let's talk a little more specifically about the relevancy of a defect. Uh, like I said, relevancy is in terms of the overall safety of the bridge. How relevant is this defect in assessing safety and structural performance? Does the defect impact the structure's ability to perform its intended purpose, uh, usually to carry traffic or, or other users? Uh, so we have some routine issues such as asphalt raveling, hairline concrete cracking, snow plow damage to curb faces, uh, things that kind of occur just based on the usual life cycle of a bridge. Uh, we would say that this is due to natural aging and usually these are not highly relevant to safety. Then we have more non-routine non issues, um, anomalies, uh, things that are, are re very relevant. Uh, this could include significant deflection of girders, uh, medium-wide flexural or shear cracks, uh, loss of material under spread footings, uh, things like that. Um, and just in general, you know, here's another tip. If you find yourself thinking, oh, I've never seen that before, or 
you know, that's really odd or that is not supposed to look like that. You know, this is a very good time to do a, a, a bit more of a defect assessment and, and go through this three-step approach of, of looking at the relevancy, the severity, and the urgency. Uh, OSIM requires re recording of all the defects, regardless of how relevant they are to safety. And so this is because all defects are relevant to condition. Uh, when we're talking about relevancy here, we're talking about relevancy to safety. And so um, this is just a generalized way to think of how relevant a defect may be to overall safety. You can categorize them into three levels. So we could say uh, a low relevancy defect is one that has little or no effect on safety today or in the future. These could be localized small spalls, uh, scaling, things like that. We could say uh, medium relevancy. So this may affect safety in the near future if left unaddressed. Uh, some uh, uh, such as loose concrete on the soffit that could, you know, fall into traffic in the future um, or right now. Uh, unevenly loaded bearings, things like that. Or we could say they are highly relevant or high relevancy. So this directly affects the safety today or in the immediate future. And so this could include medium to wide shear cracks, uh, impact damage to girders, wide flexural cracks, um, missing sidewalk joint cover plates. That's more of a, a hazard to pedestrians. And then, so the next step would be to assess severity. So let's talk about that a bit more. Uh, we've completed step one. We've determined that the defect is relevant. So now we would need to determine how severe the defect is. Uh, relevancy is probably easier to determine than severity, and that's why relevancy is a good place to start. Uh, for a lot of structural engineers, I would say relevancy is probably pretty straightforward or even obvious in most cases. I think the wheels uh, really need to start turning once we get into the severity uh, step. So here are some helpful questions to ask. We need to start thinking about these things. How much of the structure is this affecting? Uh, many of our structures today are multiple load pass structures, such as slab on girder bridges that have several girders. Uh, does the defect affect many of the girders or does it, is it just one of them? Can the structure still carry the intended loads despite that defect? Uh, is it enough to cause a major issue? So what is the magnitude of the defect? Is it major enough to substantially affect load carrying capacity of an element? How much of the capacity is remaining? Could the defect affect the overall stability of the structure? Uh, if the defect were to progress further, what would happen then? Should we expect the defect to progress further? Or do you think it's about as bad as it's gonna get? So these are, these are all good questions that uh, probably need to be answered. Uh, when we assess the severity of this exercise, we're talking about the current state of deterioration, but it's also good to think about how the severity could change in the future and uh, what exactly would change. So a lot of the assessment of severity requires experience and good engineering judgment. So I'd say this is a good time to get some other opinions from your colleagues and other knowledgeable engineers that, uh, you know, contacts you may have and just have some discussions about what you found. Uh, like relevancy, we can categorize severity into three different levels. Uh, low severity, I'd say the defect is very localized or it's minor. We have some light and medium, uh, uh, light and medium defects, so just surficial type things. Uh, scaling, honeycombing, flushing, uh, we could say they are medium severity, so a defect that's more widespread or somewhat advanced in state. Uh, most medium defects, as we would see in, in OSIM, categorized as medium. Uh, some localized severe and very severe defects, so they're severe, but uh, just maybe in non-structural components or just a small non-critical area of the bridge. Or we could categorize them as high severity. Uh, so the defect is widespread, uh, it's advanced in state, so this could include wide flexural cracks in a soffit, medium or wide shear cracks in concrete, uh, severe section loss in a, in a steel member, things, things of that nature. 
So using relevancy and severity, we can uh, talk about urgency. Once we've, urgency of a defect is um, really how quickly do we need to address it. And we can also categorize these into three levels of low, medium, and high. Uh, I'd say um, maybe it's not a good idea to say exactly what low, medium, and high urgency are in specific terms, what exactly you need to do, but in a general sense, low urgency are generally defects that uh, should be addressed when it is convenient to do so. Perhaps they can wait until work is being done on a structure as part of a rehab or replacement. Medium urgency, uh, maybe these defects are now major enough to, to drive a treatment cycle, but we have time to do a, a proper design and address all the issues at the same time. And high urgency, uh, we're probably into sort of an emergency repair type situation and action needs to be taken basically as soon as possible. Uh, with that, I'll pass it on to Jim. Thanks, Daryl. My, my name is Jim All, uh, Head of Bridge Management Section in Bridge Office MTO. For the following slides, I will discuss bridge details that require special attention, bridges with hidden member or connection, and bridges with non-redundant members or connection. Some bridge design details used in the past are known today to be problematic or even high risk that require special attention. Special care should be taken when inspecting structures with these details. The owner should be aware if their bridges with these type of details exist in their inventory. If it does, additional attention should be made to mitigate the risk of failure. Modern bridges are designed to ensure all bridge components is accessible for inspection as much as possible. However, it, this was not always the case for bridges built in the past. Some critical details or component may be hidden and cannot be visually inspected. That's why inspection engineer must review all drawings, including rehab drawings to make sure if such details exist or not. The adverse effect can be significant if those hidden components are ignored or not inspected. Special care should always be taken on bridges with little or no redundancy. Redundancy is defined as the capacity of a bridge to continue to carry some load even after the failure of one or more structural members. Redundant structure is usually a structure with multiple load paths. As mentioned, failure of one main load carrying, uh, load carrying member will not result in total collapse. A good example of redundant structure is slap on multi girder bridges. For non redundant structure, it has single load path only. Therefore, a single broken component can cause the collapse of the entire structure. For example, truss bridge or bridge with two girders only are example of non-redundant structure. Let's look at some examples. This is a steel tie art bridge about 107 meter span carrying two links traffic built in 1960. This is a single low path structure with hidden connection details. The connection at the top was hidden inside the arch member and are not visible for inspection. The hangers was the, were designed with the ends free to rotate, but these ends had seized up over time with rust and become fixed. When fixed, they were subject to bending, which caused fracturing to occur on the portion of the hanger inside the arch. There was a partial failure in 2003 Due to, the fracture, uh, due to the fatigue fracture of three steel hangers, hanger rocks, which were connected to the deck system, resulting in significant deformation in the deck. Each hanger rock 
was replaced with four cable wires after the rehab in 2005 to provide greater stability in the event of a wire failure. This is a slab bridge with suspension span in the middle carrying three lanes traffic and supporting by halving joints. The slab on the left hand side rely on the slab on the right hand side. As you can see, the condition of the halving joint is only visible mostly at the soffit. The cause of failure was due to the brittle failure of halving joint due to the factors of inadequate design, leaking expansion joint, hidden joint details, and little redundancy. For this type of connection, it's recommended that the design the, the bridge should be evaluated based on the current conditions, making sure it can handle the CHPDC loading. This is a deck truss bridge with total length of 1,160 uh, meter. The bridge was built in 1979 the main span consisted of a suspension span connected with pins. Because of non-redundancy, the whole suspension span collapsed in 1994 due to the improper welding of the steel truss of the suspension structure below the concrete slab. This bridge has a, ha, also has a suspension span in the center with length of 31 meters supported by pin and hanger system. Corrosion of the steel plate girder bridge lead to the geometric changes in the joint and generated unanticipated forces. The collapse in 1983 was caused by the failure of two pin and hanger assemblies that held the deck in place. The whole suspension span fell to the river 21 meters below. The incident was blamed on the inadequate inspection of the pin and hanger system. Another case I want to talk about is for bridge, bridges with uplift reaction. Bridges may have uplift reactions at the apartments when the end span is less than 60% of the main span adjacent to it. If the dead load of the end spans are not large enough to counteract the uplift due to the loading of, on the main span, hold down devices are required. Failure may occur if the hold down device is not designed properly or not inspected for inspection. This was a single span, 12 meter span railway bridge with 39 degrees scale built in 1870s. The bridge was originally designed with the railway track supported on longitudinal timbers spanned on the cross girders only. The main girder in the center was later covered up mostly after the bridge was rehabbed and modified in 1987. The condition was kept neglected for thorough inspection. Heavy corrosion eventually built up and weakened the main girder. Failure occurred in 2009, mainly due to the insufficient inspection and corrosion protection of this hidden center girder. So how can we manage bridge with hidden components? Of course, we need to identify bridge with such hidden component first. We need to understand what kind of risk is involved. We need to implement a targeted inspection regime to inspect hidden element regularly. Evaluation and intervention may be necessary. Mitigation works may be necessary. Make sure non-destructive tests such as ultrasonic test is used if possible. Pay attention if there's any changes in the condition, for example, due to condition degradation, changes in loading, or changes in low path of the structure. 
This is an example of how hidden details can be managed. It is a four-span DAC truss with total bridge length of 208 meter, carrying two lanes traffic above. The main span is 76 meter with 38 meter suspension span connected with pin connections. This bridge, this bridge was evaluated and even low tested to confirm its low carrying capacity. Ultrasonic tests on the pin were also performed to assess the pin conditions. The pin condition is regularly inspected visually within arm's length. As part of a major rehab for this deck truss, a pin arresting system was added. The objective is to mitigate the risk of total collapse of the center span due to the aging truss bridge and possible failure of the hidden pin connection conditions. What do we do if risk has been identified? What remedial action can be taken? The bridge should be inspected more frequently. We can instrument and monitor the bridge. We can impose load restriction on the bridge or do refined analysis, see if we can strengthen, uh, strengthen or replace some of the component or even introduce alternative flow path if possible. Lastly, if nothing can be done, the bridge should be replaced as soon as possible to reduce the possibility of failure. I would like to pass the following time to Daryl again. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, this is Daryl again. So uh, now we're gonna look at uh, five real world examples of defects that uh, were encountered during MTO inspections and uh, apply the defect assessment method that we had talked about earlier. Uh, so basically for each of these five examples, uh, hopefully I can give you just a few seconds to kind of think. Uh, first, is the bridge safe? Uh, what is or what are the critical defects that are shown? Uh, what's the relevancy, severity, and urgency of each of the critical defects? Um, so we'll look at, I'll, I'll kind of give you some general information about each bridge and we'll look at a few photos. Uh, I'll give you a couple seconds and then uh, I'll kind of go through the answer with you. So bridge number one is a timber concrete composite slab bridge, uh, which is a pretty unique structure type in itself. It has seven spans, a total length of about 48 meters, has one lane in each direction and an overall width of 11 meters was built in 1975, so it's about 45 years old. Uh, it's never been rehabbed. Uh, the bridge condition index at the time of this inspection was 65 and a half, so we would say it's an overall fair condition. Uh, so here we see some photos from the bridge deck. Uh, generally wearing surface, barriers, and sidewalk. They look like they're in, in decent condition. On the right we say we see there's a little bit of map cracking along the center line. Um, so, sort of typical, not, not too out of the ordinary. Uh, here we see some photos of the deck pesha. So we're at the side of the bridge uh, and we see the soffit on the right. If you look closely, you should notice some sagging of the deck in the left photo. Uh, it doesn't stand out quite as much in these photos, but in real life, uh, that sagging of the deck, deck timbers there was uh, was pretty noticeable. Uh, sagging was worse around the, the deck drain that you can see on the right side of that uh, left photo. Uh, there's definitely something kind of going on here with this timber deck. Uh, we see a lot of discoloration, and some of the timbers seem to be sagging lower than the rest. Uh, again, it's, it's kind of tricky to see in the photo, but those white discolored ones, you can kind of see that some are hanging down a little lower than the, the rest of the, the timber deck. Um, the photo sh here shows the worst location. In reality, there were actually a 
couple areas where the deck looked like this, like it wasn't in great condition. Uh, I think it's also important to note that this isn't a, a slab on girder type bridge. The timber concrete composite deck in this case is the main load carrying element. Uh, here we see a cross section of the bridge, some of the details showing uh, the lamination of the timber deck shows how the designer provided the shear transfer between the concrete and the timber deck so that they can achieve composite action. Uh, these ridges essentially act as shear studs, so they ensure that the concrete and the timber act as one section. Uh, so interaction between the timber and the concrete here is very important in order for the deck to maintain its required structural capacity. That was assumed in the design. So uh, I ask you, is the bridge safe? Uh, what, what do you think is the critical defect? And what is the relevancy, urgency, and severity of the defect? Um, so the critical defect, probably you could guess, is the severe sagging of the timber deck near the, near the deck drain. Uh, this results in a loss of the composite action with the concrete deck, so the strength is compromised. And as I mentioned, that, that deck is, is the main load carrying element here in this bridge. Uh, the location where we see the worst of it is at a mid-span, so uh, we would expect to have the maximum of ending of uh, load on, on the bridge in that area. Uh, and we would say the bridge is potentially unsafe. The defect is highly relevant. It's very severe in nature and is uh, highly urgent to address. Uh, in this case, it did take some further work to determine how urgent this defect was. There was an evaluation done to confirm, confirm that the timbers acting on their own in that condition did not have the structural resistance required to support the loads that could act on that structure. Um, and these, the photos you saw were from an inspection in 2016, and as a result, this bridge has actually now been replaced. Uh, bridge number two. Uh, this is a pony truss or a half-through truss. Uh, it's a single span, simply supported bridge with a total length of 37 meters. Carries two lanes of traffic, has an overall width of 2.4 meters. It was built in 1953, so it's uh, 66 years old. It's had a number of improvements done over its life uh, and a pretty significant rehabilitation in 1992 with some more minor maintenance and strengthening work at various points between 2003 and 2012. It has a BCI of 66 at the time of this inspection, so we'd say it's an overall fair condition. Uh, so here are some photos. On the left, we see one of the bearings. Uh, I'd say it has some pretty significant corrosion and section loss. Uh, we see some corrosion product kind of building up around those bolts and maybe some uh, loss of section and, and uh, corrosion, layers of corrosion product on the bearing itself. Uh, I noticed some disintegration of the concrete beneath the bearing, but so far it doesn't seem to be undermining the bearing itself. On the right is a photo of the abutment wall uh, just below the same bearing. Uh, looks to me like we have pretty significant delamination, some spalling and some cracking beneath that bearing. Uh, so a few more photos on the left. It's another photo of the abutment wall below the same bearing, but taken if we were standing beneath the, uh, yeah, beneath the bridge. Uh, from this angle, I think it's starting to look like a bit more than just the delamination of the concrete. Looks like we have some pretty significant cracking and deep spalling. Uh, it actually extends below, at least below the first mat of reinforcing. But then we look on the right, we have a photo of that same bearing seat looking at it from the side. So we're looking at the wing wall and the side of the abutment. And now we can see, oh, that cracking actually looks like it goes uh, all the way through the corner of the abutment and bearing seat here. And we have some significant separation of the bearing seat from the rest of the abutment. Uh, most of these photos are keying in on the same thing. So maybe this one's a little more obvious than the first bridge. I think we probably all can guess what the defect is here, but 
uh, is the bridge safe? Uh, what's the relevancy, severity, and urgency of this defect? Well, the critical defect, as you probably guessed, is that severe lamination and separation of the abutment at that at that bearing. So if this part of the abutment, which supports one of only two truss members, was to fail, I think that's going to affect the stability of the bridge pretty significantly and could lead to a partial or total collapse of the bridge. So I would say this defect is highly relevant to the safety of the bridge. I think it's very severe in nature and should be addressed uh, urgently. So I'd give it a high urgency. Hopefully you agree. Uh, bridge number three is a steel plate eye girder. Uh, it's a three span, pretty significant bridge of the total length of 158 meters. Um, has a sort of a typical span arrangement. It's uh, 10 meters wide with one lane in each direction. It's located up in Northwest Ontario. Uh, it was built in 1975, so it's 44 years old. Uh, it had a bit of a minor rehab, probably just like a repaving in 2011, but a more significant rehab in 1998. And it had a bridge condition index of 68.4 at the last inspection. So we would say it's, a, it's in fair condition as well, but close to good. Uh, so our first photo on the left is of the structural steel girders and bracing. You can see the deck soffit as well. Uh, generally, I think these elements all look like they're in pretty good condition. Uh, the photo on the right is one of the piers. It appears to be founded directly, directly on some exposed bedrock. Uh, we, so we have a four girder system. Some creative individuals have added their own aesthetic features to the pier here and Behind that, I think we can see some narrow cracking, but uh, generally nothing too significant. Uh, here we see some photos of one of the abutments and we see some pretty significant spalling and deterioration or disintegration of the concrete on the bearing seat. Uh, some exposed reinforcing. And when we get a little closer, see on the photo to the left, we see uh, missing concrete is actually Looks like it's even undermining the bearing itself. Uh, so uh, what's the defect? Is the bridge safe? Uh, how relevant to safety is the, is the defect? How severe is it? And what is the urgency to address it? Well, the critical defect is the, the very severe disintegration of the abutment near the girder bearing. Uh, failure to this area could lead into uh, a localized displacement of the superstructure. I wouldn't say that uh, it would affect the overall stability of the bridge like the last one. And that's mostly because we have uh, a multiple girder system here that provides redundancy. I would say the bridge is probably still safe, but the defect should be addressed uh, somewhat quickly. So I'd say the defect is medium relevancy because of the redundancy. It's very severe in nature uh, and it is somewhat urgent to address. So I'd probably put a medium severity or medium urgency. Uh, example number four. This is a, a rigid frame T-beam type structure, uh, three span continuous with uh, 57 meters total length uh, spans of 16 meter approach spans and 25 meter main span, 13 meter overall width with uh, two traveled lanes located in eastern Ontario, roughly, and uh, it was built in 1953. So it's 66 years old. Uh, it had one rehab in 2005, which was a pretty major rehab, included an overlay. Uh, the current BCI is 71. So we'd say it's in good condition overall. Here we see some photos of uh, one of the abutments. Looks like there was some patch repairs done here, likely from the previously mentioned rehab. Uh, on the right, we see a general photo of one of the barrier walls in the sidewalk. We see some pattern cracking on the barrier wall, which I would say is probably pretty a routine, typical defect. 
as barrier walls are exposed to a lot of salt and uh, chlorides make their way to the steel and often cause deterioration, say it's a, located in a very severe environment. Uh, here we see some photos from below the bridge. Uh, we see the interior of one of the girders. It looks like some type of a repair has been done on, on both the interior and exterior of that girder. Uh, we see a pretty significant crack running longitudinally along the exterior of the beam, and I wouldn't say that's something we see very often. Um, you know, maybe in beams we might see shear cracks or flexural cracks. Those are also bad, but uh, a little more typical. This is sort of an odd one. I'd, as it runs longitudinally across the, the bottom of that girder. Um, so, um, what do you think? Is the bridge safe? What's the critical defect? What's the relevancy, severity, and urgency? Um, well, the critical defect is definitely that wide longitudinal crack in the exterior girder. Um, uh, the defect indicates that there's some sort of distress in the girder and uh, a large crack like this can definitely accelerate rebar corrosion because uh, it allows moisture and chlorides to get to the reinforcing steel and so you know that can accelerate the, the corrosion and shorten the, the life of this girder, uh, reduce its overall strength. But we do have a multiple beam system and a monolithic superstructure that uh, acts together and transfers forces and so it provides redundancy. I would say that this bridge is likely still safe uh, but the defect should be addressed quickly because uh, the longer it stays the more damage it do is done. So I would say that that defect is medium relevancy, uh, it's severe in nature and somewhat urgent to, urgent to address but I wouldn't say that this one is, is super black and white uh, it's not a flexural crack, as I said, but the, the girder is clearly under distress and a, a wide long crack like this definitely affects the way the girder behaves. Uh, it will uh, affect the structural resistance of the girder in some way. Uh, I think the cracking happened somewhat recently since they patched this area in that rehab uh, and it's pretty unlikely this defect was present then and, and wasn't addressed. So, you know, it's formed somewhat recently. And, you know, perhaps something they did as part of that rehab is actually the cause of, of this defect. Uh, that, that rehab included an overlay, so maybe some of this additional loading could cause something like that. Um, one thing for sure is a wide crack like this will allow moisture and chlorides to get to the reinforcing steel and accelerate corrosion. Uh, and our last example is a suspension steel arch. It probably looks familiar because it was in some of Jim's photos earlier on. Um, it's a single span arch. It's 109.6 meters in length, so it's pretty significant. Um, 12 meters overall width. Uh, it's, in North, it's located in Northeast Ontario. It's nine, built in 1960, so it's about 60 years old. Um, it was had a major rehab done in 1992 and 2004 it had a deck and girder replacement and that was a result of that uh, hangar failure that you saw earlier and uh, so the current BCI is 82.5 so we'd say it's in in good condition or very good condition uh, here are some photos of the superstructure. Uh, we see the structural steel and hangar system, and we see the deck. Uh, generally, everything seems to look in pretty good condition. Uh, here we see some photos of where the arch is supported by the abutment. Uh, we see some deterioration, delamination, spalling, uh, where, where that steel arch uh, bears on the concrete abutment. On the right, we also see a wide vertical crack. Well, that's interesting. Uh, so what do you think? Is it, What's the critical defect? Is the bridge safe? What's the relevancy, severity, and urgency? Well, uh, I tried to trick you guys a little on this one. So the critical defect here is actually the wide crack and not the delamination of the concrete below the bearing. Uh, this defect started as some uh, narrower cracking not as much of it and you know over some inspections the 
the quantity and severity of those cracks grew and it became apparent that uh, the cracks indicate uh, sort of a tension failure on, on the front face rebar of that abutment. Um, so the abutment here, because it's it's resisting the thrust of that arch, uh, the abutment wants to, to pull apart due to those two concentrated bearing reactions. Um, there is some redundancy in, in the remainder of the bars, but uh, if the abutment fails, the entire bridge could actually collapse if those uh, arch members were allowed to separate. You could see how that would affect the overall stability of the bridge. Uh, the bridge is likely safe in the short term, but this issue does need to be addressed as it's uh, getting worse over time. And uh, so it should be done as quickly as possible. So I'd say uh, the defect could be medium or high relevancy because there is some redundancy, uh, but the defect is severe in nature and is highly urgent to address. And uh, what we ended up doing to address this issue was uh, we installed some post-tensioning transversely across that abutment to uh, provide some uh, additional strength and to, to essentially tie that abutment together laterally and close up those cracks. Uh, so in summary, we want to stress that the number one goal of a bridge inspection is to assess safety. Uh, that's the number one reason we have people going out there. Uh, we probably spend the most time assessing condition, but uh, we, the most important thing really is safety and ensuring that bridges are safe for the public. Um, we think that you, people should spend time critically thinking about the cause and effect of defects. Uh, how, how relevant is it to safety? If it is relevant, how bad is it? And how urgently should this be addressed? Um, we want people to remember that some bridges have details that require special attention um, or things that are hidden. And if that's the case, then uh, people should be on high alert and they should be fully aware of, of things that need to be have more time spent on them. Uh, filling out an OSIM inspection form and quantifying defects is secondary to assessing safety. Um, and it's also really important to immediately flag urgent inspection items to owners. So if you're a bridge inspection inspector doing an inspection for a bridge owner, um, you should really make the owners aware of that defect as soon as possible and uh, uh, they're ultimately responsible for these bridges and, and they should be allowed to uh, make their own calls on relevancy, severity and urgency of a, of a defect. Um, so don't just put them in the OSIM report and kind of wait till somebody reads that report. I think it's important to, to make a phone call or send an email and make sure people are aware. Um, that's all we have for you today. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll be happy to try and field some questions that you may have. Uh, I think you can ask those on using the chat box, right? Yes, they can. Thanks. Uh, Daryl, Jim, that was a lot of great information. We do already have a question. If we can scroll back your presentation to case study number four, the question is, was it determined that the bridge in case number four was overstressed due to the overlay and new barriers? Sorry, can you say that again? Yep. Uh, so the question, was it determined that the bridge here was overstressed due to the overlay and new barriers? Uh, it was not determined that that was the actual cause, but, um, uh, you know, it, it's a suggestion. I don't think we, we actually looked into that yet. Uh, to be honest, this was one of Neil's examples that he was going to go through, and uh, he probably knows this particular case better than I do. Um, but yeah, it wasn't determined that that was the specific cause of the crack. And it wasn't a structural crack, so uh, I guess adding load to it, maybe to say that that is what caused the crack, it doesn't actually really make sense. Uh, it's, it is hard, to, we don't, I don't know exactly what caused the crack in that situation. Okay, well, thank you for, <laughs> for trying to give us a bit more clarification there. Does anyone else have any questions out there? Oh, I do have another question. Um, what goes into making the BCI score? 
so BCI is calculated based on uh, sort of a formula that we have that calculates the current value of the bridge uh, as a proportion of the total replacement value of a bridge. So for each uh, element type, we have sort of a general unit cost and uh, unit cost times the quantity of that element equals the replacement, the total replacement cost once you add up all the elements. And um, based on the condition that we get from an inspection, we would sort of discount that value to get the current value. So, you know, you get full points for uh, an element that's in excellent condition, but you uh, maybe get 75% of the value if uh, part of that element is in good condition or less if it's in fair or poor condition. So BCI is essentially the current value over the total replacement value of the bridge. For our next question, it's from someone who's in public works, but they don't necessarily are not necessarily an engineer or aren't necessarily part of the engineering group um, who does the OSIM. Um, they want to start an annual maintenance inspection that's going to be performed uh, by non-structural engineers. Um, so sorry, instead of by engineers, it'd be done by the staff who are always out on the public works staff are on the roads, who are the ones who are always seeing, fixing, and doing repairs on a day-to-day -day basis. So the specific question in this instance is, what parts of the OSIM manual could be adopted to do this successfully? Um, OSIM, it's, it's a very um, detailed manual telling inspector what to look for uh, when they inspecting the bridge. So in terms of the maintenance type of inspection, I think the most important of all um, is to look at the, the, uh, the safety of the bridge visually, uh, whether, whether there's any uh, concrete falling or whether there's a major cracks or whether the, the, um, any tilting of the structure, any unsafe situation that the, the maintenance staff observe should notify the, the engineer as soon as possible. So we, we don't expect um, the maintenance staff to do or to calculate the, uh, the BCI of the bridge or, uh, or to uh, perform such a, a detailed uh, quantitative type of inspection work, but at least to have uh, overall visually inspected of the safety of the, uh, of the element uh, of the bridge uh, making sure everything is safe to him or her. Thank you. Uh, we have another question about BCI. Uh, specifically, when calculating the BCI, are certain elements given a weighted advantage or weighted average? Average, excuse me, considering their level of importance. So, for example, uh, barriers, handrails, given less weight than girders or supports. Yeah, that's right. So like when I said a, a unit cost, so the unit cost for say a concrete girder is much higher than the unit cost of, of a barrier railing or something like that, right? So we used, um, you know, uh, actual costing information to come up with uh, the correct values for those. So it's not really directly tied to their structural value or their relevancy um, but it's more to their cost of what would be the cost to to build that new if that makes sense and we we don't we don't uh, calculate the bci for all elements of the bridge but uh, mainly include the major elements like the uh, the steel girder um, the barrier walls uh, and the concrete deck slab something like that So another question that we've had come up, um, going back to, I guess you guys had a chart with regards to the different levels of urgency. And so the question is, why would loose concrete over traffic not be classified as urgent? Um, well, I think it says loose concrete. So I guess it depends where is that loose concrete. And in some cases, loose concrete would be urgent. And in some cases, 
it would not be. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, another question that's come in is, what about the piers and footings? Do those get inspected during OSIM inspections? Can you repeat that one? I didn't oh, play sorry. Uh, so with regards to piers and footings, do they get inspected during OSIM inspections? Yes, they do. <laughs> well, um, the pier, of course, anything visually inspected will, will be uh, inspected, of course, but if the footing is hidden um, below ground, so obviously we cannot inspect. Great. I think that takes care of pretty much all of the questions that have come up so far. Of course, we're going to have these, uh, this presentation available on our website afterwards. I'm going to sneak in a quick plug for OGRA's uh, bridge inspection course that takes place as part of our municipal infrastructure training program every year in the winter. So please do check out our education calendar for that. Um, so thank you, Daryl, Jim, for giving us a great presentation. Thank you to everybody for attending. Uh, there's a couple more questions that have come in, and if it's okay, maybe I'll send those out to the group afterwards. No problem. Sure. Yeah, right. we can provide a, a more written, concise response to any of the questions afterwards, too. Perfect. You know, how's about I'll summarize all the questions that everybody had, to have you guys give us some answers that we can put in all in one spot, and then we can send that out to everybody who attended today. Sounds good. Great. Thank you, everyone, so much for attending, and have a great day.